Okay. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to our um, weekly seminar series at the Department of Marine Geosciences. And today we are honored to host uh, Professor uh, Michel Diniz from uh, the Free University in uh, Berlin and the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, Michel. Um, Michel uh, is going to uh, talk about oases and uh, redification. Also, ecosystem changes in an oasis agriculture in the central Sahara and Arabia, which is pretty close to our area in Israel. So a little bit about uh, Michelle. And between 92 and 2000, she studied at the University of Stuttgart, Hohenheim, uh, a diploma thesis in urban ecology, uh, entitled Floristic and Vegetation Aspects of the um, Urban Area a bad can stats under consideration of the utilization. Then uh, in 2000 and 2002, oh. she works in paleoecological labs, palynology, then the chronology, and archaeobotomy at the University of Stuttgart in Holmheim. If I did a mistake, please let me know, Michelle. Um, 2006, she finished a fellowship um, of uh, paleontological investigation of eight Myers to reconstruct latest Pleistocene and Holocene climate in Eastern Germany. And until 2019, she uh, worked as a research assistant at the Free University in Berlin, the GFZ in Potsdam, the MPI in Hamburg, and University in Köln and Munich. And archaeological offices in Sachsen and Brandenburg in Germany. Um, so as you noticed, she is a palynologist and archaeobotanist, working in the latest Pleistocene and Olesen sites, lakes, mires, bogs, archaeological sites in Northern, Northern Africa, Arabia, and Central Europe, focusing on natural climate rearing and anthropogenic ecosystem changes. Since 2019, she is a scientific employee at the Fry Free University in Berlin, with a with a main project degree, which is the greening of the Central Sahara, Olosen environmental dynamics in the Tibesti Mountains and Onyanga Basin in Chad, with the PI of um, Holtzman. So, Michelle, the podium is yours. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction. And uh, I'm very honored to present our results here. And um, yes, I'm just a uh, um, uh, employee at the Freie University, it's the only thing I just wanted to correct. You know, I'm, I'm a fellow at the Freie University and I'm botanist and I'm botanist, so we'll focus a lot on botany. And so if please, if you have questions because I go too fast through it, um, don't hesitate to ask them. Yes, um, so we'll start. Uh, oh, the, the I, it doesn't uh, go on. Maybe in the PowerPoint you should um, yes. click uh, in maybe in over there. Maybe try again clicking. Ah, yeah, over there. Well, uh, sorry, sorry. Kino. thank you very much. You know, it it hanged a little bit. You know, so um, first I want to say, of course, you are always looking at um, a variety of proxies um, to reconstruct climate of the past in your institute and. Um, now you invited something or somebody talking about botany and pollen and to reconstruct past vegetation. Um, why should we really look at the past vegetation and not directly on climate proxy? So these are one thing I want to present shortly at the beginning. And afterwards, this came across because we are, I am closely working together with archaeologists. Um, we had first to define about what we were talking when we are talking of aridization. It was okay, but then we, when we started to talk about was it what is an oasis, we saw that um, we are talking from different things. So I will shortly give a definition of oasis and um, then present the two case studies and compare the evolutions in these two areas. One is in the central Sahara, as you already um, said, and the other is very close to your country, Israel. It's in, in um, Taima in Northwestern um, Saudi Arabia. And at the end, I'll give um, summarizing conclusions. So um, again, to the question, um, why may vegetation be a useful proxy if we look not only at climate change, but uh, at climate change and how human dealt in the past to um, with these um, changes. 
Um, so if we look today at the vegetation, um, here's a very nice map of um, Olsen et al. Um, of the distribution of the different vegetation types in the world. And um, if we look at this map below and look what people wrote there about the vegetation, they said that the humans um, today use at about 25% of the net primary production um, of the potential vegetation that um, you see the major importance of uh, the vegetation. And of course, you know it, but it's always nice to remember it. Um, the immense important vegetation place for people in living in their environment. And I think a visual impression is to show where I'm living here in Berlin in Brandenburg, you have these nice um, woodlands um, that would be there if no humans would act in there, yes. And then you see the different types of land use that are possible in these ecosystems or in these biomes, for example, the grazing and opening the forests up to agriculture, vast um, fields with um, different cereals or pulses or things like this. And if you look in other regions of the world, like the desert region, to see a completely different image um, with um, here it is the wadi vegetation, which is very loose, but otherwise you see always or not much vegetation. And of course, there are other land use possibilities um, are given. For, you can, of course, um, make um, uh, husbandry and herding and um, agriculture, but it looks quite different and you have to deal with other difficulties. And of course, you will um, use other crop, crop plants. So to summarize, it's very, um, yes, <laughs> straightforward. Um, you can see climate may change. So there may be no rain and there may be a lot of rain and there may be lakes that um, appear and disappear. But what is most important for humans afterward is what really this climate change does in their environment. So what vegetation type is there and what can they use and how can they live with it and how can they manage it? Um, and one, um, yes, a very um, um, easy way um, to reconstruct the past vegetation is really to look at um, 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 plant remains that are conserved um, through the time. And um, two major proxies there, or two major types of plants that are remain through the time are the pollen. Here you see some examples of the pollen and of course the macro remains of the plants themselves. Um, um, you see different types of pollen here. That's uh, how we work. So um, the plants produce pollen and um, pollen types um, can uh, be related to the, um, of course, to the plant who produces it. And some pollen types include a large variety of different plant species, and some are rather um, distinct. For example, here, the wine pollen, it's um, a rather, um, yes, it's really only grape wine pollen or for ephedra, and other include a, a large number of different species, like um, here, the and the same holds true for the macro remains. And there often you can go down to the species to determine like olive or here the um, grape wine pips or here little um, fig seeds. And um, what we now are doing is um, to use these different plant remains to reconstruct the past vegetation. One major thing is the pollen analysis. I just showed you the pollen grains. And what we are then doing there is um, to um, count a lot of different pollen spectra. I will show it um, in the next slides. And then we can trace by the means of pollen analysis really the um, long-term vegetation changes um, like this one here shown in this pollen diagram, um, the degreening of the Sahara, for example. Um, the other ways, it's most a combination of macro remains and um, pollen. What we can do is to reconstruct um, the different um, land use practices, um, the herding, the managing of the different ecosystem up to crop plant cultivation. And finally, of course, we can trace um, things like trade um, or um, food 
production uh, cooking um, if we are happy or lucky to find um, the um, remains um, yeah, preserved. So um, just a few words um, to easier understand it, how we get our archives for the pollen analysis and the um, plant macro remains. Um, of course, we are going um, pouring outside that may be either in um, um, lakes that are persisting until today or in lakes that are desiccated and um, um, covered by other sediments. Um, um, because pollen only preserves when they are um, under anaerobic conditions. So here you see um, where we are pouring. Here you see a nice core. It's the core of, uh, section of the core of um, timer. And what we then do, we go in the pollen there because we want to get rid of, of everything only uh, what is in the sediment included there. Um, and we only want to have the pollen at the end. Um, it's a very um, yes, easy and not complicated um, preparation in the pollen lab. We um, um, take off the chalk and um, we um, uh, try to get rid of the humid acids. And afterwards, um, we separate by density medium the mineralogenic components of compositions of the components of the sediment. And here you see a very concentrated um, result of the prepared pollen sample. And here um, some of, um, yes, uh, more isolated how I um, really then have them under the microscope. And um, on the microscope, when I'm happy, it's the where I pass the most of the time because then um, we count every pollen type um, in lines. And um, yes, uh, then we we construct our pollen diagrams and that's um, how we do it. Um, so we have here the First, the core material, and of course, the core, um, the deepest part of the core are the oldest part, um, and then the youngest part here. And then um, every pollen spectra I counted, I then plot the um, pollen percentage value of the different pollen types to show the evolution of um, the landscape change by pollen analysis. And for macro remains, a little bit um, other. Mostly there, we work very closely together with the um, archaeologists in excavations, and, and they get out or give us the sediments um, out of the archaeological features. And then, um, especially in arid regions, um, the macro remains usually are only preserved chart, and then we um, float them out of the sediments. Um, and of course dry them and then um, look at them under the binocular, not under the microscope. And then it's the same proced procedure. We try to determine it and um, count how many of the different seed types or wood um, particles is um, in the sample there. And then we can um, plot them or put them together in tables. So. But now to the case studies, now you know how we work. And um, yes, um, as I already mentioned, one um, core is out of the Northeastern um, Chad in the Central Sahara and one core out um, of um, the oasis of Taima in Northwestern Saudi Arabia. And um, what um, will be presented from these works is, um, the twofold. So I'll show the long-term vegetation changes that are mainly triggered by climatic fluctuations. Thus, for the Sahara, it's the regreening and then the degreening of the central Sahara during the Holocene. And um, with this, the emergence of oasis in um, the central Sahara. And then um, ask if the same happened in northwestern Saudi Arabia. Um, was there too a greening and a degreening of the desert? And um, uh, the other major question will be, um, of course, oases are, um, yes, green spots in the desert. Um, and um, how these green spots, these refuge in the desert um, were um, um, manipulated and um, built up by humans after the natural um, oasis um, appeared or was built up. And as I already told at the beginning, 
first of all, we had to <laughs> clarify a little bit what we are talking about. So before the archaeologists, archaeologists at the beginning, our oasis was only an oasis settlement. So for them, the oasis started when people went there and um, built buildings and um, um, large walls. And um, so we said, oh, no, the, the oasis was there before people made um, built up their, their walls and buildings. And so we first um, tried to find a definition of how of what we are talking, and we found um, it is usual for us to um, differentiate them in two categories: so the natural oasis and the artificial oasis. Um, the natural oasis we divided them into the groundwater fed oasis. These are the oasis types we um, are working on at the moment. And then, of course, uh, there are the wadi oasis, um, where the vegetation is very similar to the um, groundwater fed um, oasis. And then, something other really are the large um, river oasis, such as the Nile or Euphrates or Tigris, and things like this. And um, another thing, of course, are the artificial oasis that really um, got um, was built only by humans by pumping the deep groundwater um, and then cultivating there. But we don't, uh, we we are not investigating um, this at the moment. So first, we want to go into the Central Sahara. Here you see a map. Um, here is Libya and the Sudan, Egypt, and um, here you have the High Tibesti Mountains and the Energy Mountains. And in between these two mountains here is the Onyanga Basin with the um, Lake Yua, where um, the Colon um, crew did um, corings twice, um, one a shorter core um, who covered the last 6,000 years, and then they went back and cored um, even deeper. And now we are very happy to have a core that covers the last 10,000 years. Um, there's a continuous sedimentation and it's nearly continuous dwarfed. So we have um, a very um, good um, material to, to work on. So, yes. Um, and now <laughs> we go directly into the bone diagram we caught, or the Cologne group caught there in the Central Sahara. As I already said, here is um, the the axis is the it gives the calibrated years before present, and um, then the different um, percentage frequencies of the pollen types that were recorded are plotted. And to make it easier to read the pollen diagram, because most um, mostly on the botanist like pollen diagrams and other people not. Um, we color coded a little bit the thing and um, organized this in always the same way. So um, here um, the, the grasses, the poaceae, because of the main biomass producers during the savanna types um, and afterwards even as desert um, ecosystem type. Two, um, are plotted at the beginning and um, something that is a little bit uh, um, opposite is the goose food family representatives, the Amarantaceae, and these are typical for the um, desert vegetation or semi-desert vegetation. It's why it's um, colored in um, yellow. And then there are plotted different types of the um, semi-desert vegetation in orange. There are some that are useful, for example, the toothbrush or um, balanitis, the uh, um, desert palm, you'll know them perhaps too. And here the, the doom palm, a, um, um, a native um, palm species of the Sahara. And then it continues with the color codes with the thorn savanna, for example, um, the comifora, the mur, and other representatives. And here in really green are the representatives of the um, deciduous savanna, thus the savanna that indicates the most um, humid um, conditions there in the area. And finally, in blue are the plants that represent or the pollen types that represent the riverine vegetation. Um, here it's only um, the cattail and these are um, pollen types that represent the pollen flux out of the Tibesti mountains. So and if we look at this pollen diagram you can clearly see 
that here at the end, where it's our desert vegetation today, Amaranth sea dominates really largely. And if we look at the beginning, we see, oh, okay, there it wasn't really desert. Um, something already happened before sedimentation started in the Onyanga or Lake or Lake Lua Basin. So um, we don't have really the beginning of the beginning of the um, um, humid period in the central Sahara, but there already already some um, humidity was there that triggered vegetation um, changes because we don't have, as I said, the desert we have today. And um, this fits, of course, very so sorry, I forget to say our course starts at about 10,300, something like this. Um, thus, there was a humidity increase before, and this fits very well in the compilation. For example, Philip Holzmann and Holmes did together for the um, Central Sahara and or for the full Sahara or the entire Sahara. And um, similarly, things um, uh, Anne Marie Lezin did with her co authors. And here you see that. Um, these blue cores are the lake levels at their highest states here in um, light blue, um, and when they are lowering, and then when they disappeared. And the same is here. So these are the, in dark blue the curves of the um, lake sediments, then the um, palustrine and um, uh, fluviatil sediments and palustrine sediments. And you see here that the um, humidity increase that are um, recorded in the lake formation and lake um, level rise started already at about um, 11,000 500. So this is missing in our record. We are just um, starting here when lake level in many um, basins already were rather high. Um, just because we were on lake level and lake level, high lake level and low lake level here um, to give you an impression of, for, of our lake and um, its past um, size. Here you see um, the Onyanga Basin with Lake Tele amongst other and here um, with Yua. And if um, we flood the basin according the highest diatomit um, that were found um, in different positions, um, you see that the lake was very, very large as compared to today's and the lake were all together, um, so much together to a big lake um, surface. So, but now back to our record, what we now see um, is, uh, we, or we already saw um, the um, humidity increase before sedimentation, but now we see a slow regreening of the Sahara from um, a semi-desert vegetation here to the Son Tavana. And um, because of archaeological records are missing directly in the Onyanga Basin, we always look for archaeological um, um, findings in the surroundings. And um, it was the time of the hunter-gatherers more in the north in the Fezan. Um, and then um, the regreening of the Sahara continues, as you see here, the first, for the first time, the real deceitious savanna representatives are um, recorded. Um, and then at about 8,000, there is a distinct um, switch in the riverine vegetation and um, an increase in more desert vegetation um, that's uh, most distinct at about uh, 8,200 to 8,000. So our hypothesis is that here we see something like a distinct lake level lowering, um, then the riverine um, banks were all um, covered by reed vegetation with, for example, the cat kale. Um, yes, and then afterwards, um, the lake level um, rose again, um, and the um, thorn savanna, and afterwards the savanna um, um, re-established again. Then that's what I already said. After this um, short um, lake level fall, the um, savanna vegetation of the dis Sea savanna, which indicates the most humid period in, in the central Sahara, re-established. 
But what is really, oops, uh, what is really interesting, it's um, I I now counted more samples, but there are highly fluctuating the 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 values of the savanna vegetation, and that's one question we want um, to resolve now. Um, whether this is because the savanna system of itself is very um, 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 dynamic, or whether we are always on only um, at the front of the um monsoon that are supposed um, to have um, gone much more in the north and that the lake Yoa is just on the position of the northernmost front of this monsoon and that's why we have always this fluctuation when the monsoon is just passed through the um, uh, um, Yoa record then we have um, more savanna and when it's just retreated a little bit we have a little bit less, less savanna um, yes, but then um, that's um, the same time where the now um, a subsistence change um, had place. So um, the forager and hunter gatherer are now replaced by the um, cattle herders. Um, and then already is nearly the we reached the end of the green um, Sahara at about 6,500. You see that there are still um, some um, concrete which indicate the, the seediest, the most wettest savanna in our case. But at the same time, um, um, Sahelian, so um, um, thorn savanna, semi-desert element, um, became more important. That means that at least in the landscape that surrounds the lake, um, there was a change or the beginning of um, aridization in the vegetation. And um, this finally ends at about um, 5,500 when really the last, um, 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 yes, major types of the Deshido savanna disappears. And then the semi desert and um, thorn savanna vegetation um, becomes more dominant. And that's the time in the archaeologic and archaeology in this um, larger region um, where um, the cattle cult becomes even more sophisticated, mega tombs or other megalithic tombs for people and cattle were erected and um, 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 uh, Smith postulated that it's the same time that people become more and more connected. So if we shortly summarize it, um, we can see that, um, that there was a stepwise wetting up during the early Holocene and um, that during the green period in the central Sahara, there was um, a deciduous savanna landscape, but it was not a stable system, it highly fluctuated. And then um, we see that it was a stepwise aridization in the um, during the middle Holocene and um, we see that the switches from one vegetation type to another so for example from the Deshida savanna to the thorn savanna it's rather abrupt but if you had looked at the curve of the grasses of the Boise it's really a slow 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 decline so we can see at least in the pollen record of the central Sahara that's not an abrupt um, um, loss of plant cover, but it's um, um, a, a, a more or less um, gradual um, um, lose of um, plant cover. Yes. So, and then if we look at the upper part um, of the record, um, we see that aridization um, continues. Semi-desert vegetation established around the Lake Yua. And now it's the moment if we look at the botanical definition of oasis, we um, said that um, a lake becomes an oasis when it's um, surrounded by semi-desert vegetation. So this would be the moment when we can say, okay, it's the Onyanga Basin now oasis started to form and um, the semi-desertation vegetation, semi-desert vegetation established around the oasis. And it's at the same time, for, um, especially in Fezan, the, where the first pastoral group settled down at uh, oasis and um, focused on goat herding. 
but at Lake Yoa, we don't have any indications that there was oasis cultivation. If we go further uh, to the younger periods, so already fication um, continued, we now see that the desert vegetation has the major part. And um, again, we don't have in Yoa um, a hint that there was oasis cultivation, but we have oasis cultivation here in the Fezan, north of the Lake Lua. There really the people probably coming, yes, uh, that settled there, the government, um, they had an established oasis cultivation with date palms and other fruit trees and um, cereals. And only at about 2000 years ago, there in, um, uh, in Lake Yoa and in the Onyanga Basin, oasis cultivation started. And um, it's recorded here with a first um, date palm record. And, and at the same time, the um, doom palm record increases. The doom palm is native to the central Sahara. I can see it because we can trace it the whole time. Um, but now the people seem to um, propagate it much more than they did before. So uh, if we finish our interim summary, we can see that the natural oasis only emerged during the end of the Middle Holocene or the beginning of Late Holocene in, um, in Yua in the Central Sahara. And oasis cultivation um, started even much later that it was not a direct um, response to the aridization. So, and now we'll switch to um, um, Taima in um, northern Saudi Arabia or northwestern Saudi Arabia. Um, this was um, a twofold project. So first we started, um, it's called the Holocene Vegetation History of the Oasis of Taima, and it was founded by the um, Thyssen Stiftung. And the PI there was a botanist um, from the Freie University. And, and then um, and another multi-proxy crew, I think most of them of you or many of you know them, um, was the CLEAR project that continued the work in the Taima Oasis um, to reconstruct the environmental um, history um, of this unique record in Northwestern Saudi Arabia. So here you see the Oasis of Taima and here in the background, this is the Sepka where our poor are from and under the Sepka sediments underlying there are lake sediments. Yes, and here again, you have an escarpment a little bit like in Europe, but much um, smaller, yes. Um, here you see the, again, to, just to remember the position of Timer and that's um, a precipitation map um, reconstructed after um, from Al Masuri. Um, and um, you see that Timer is in the, yes, one of the drier parts of lying in the drier parts of the Northwestern um, Arabian Peninsula. But um, if you look there in this direction, it's, um, it's much more rainy than in Yua where we just were. And here's a um, generalized best vegetation map again with timer here and um, the sand desert Nafut and here the Hijaz mountains. Yes, I think you know it better, or at least as good as me here. And here are the Sepka of Taima, and it's um, a little bit the same reconstruction um, uh, than in Yua. The highest position of the shoreline deposits were taken, and then um, the maximum lake extent um, of the lake at Taima was um, reconstructed. And um, yeah, here you see the today um, Sepka. So you see the dimensions of changes are um, smaller than in um, the central Sahara. Um, again, a pollen diagram, but it's much more shorter. And um, here it's um, with the great results of the um, um, working group at the GFZ Potsdam of um, Ina Neugebauer and um, um, Dräger, Nadine Dräger and of course Birgit Plessen. These are the delta 18 O values plotted. Um, and again, here the, pollen, the different pollen types plotted together. And the color co codes um, are a little bit the same, or no, are more or less the same than in um, Yua. In orange are the semi desert vegetation. These are something special here. It's not the mountains from the Tibesti, but the steppe vegetation, probably from the Iran Turanian elements from the 
um, northeast. Um, and um, you see a clear difference. First of all, the core is not that long as in Jura because the lake started at Taima at only about uh, 900, about 3000. And um, it um, um, desiccated or it goes through then to a SEPCA um, system at about 4200 before today. Um, and here at the end in green are types that we didn't find in the Central Sahara. These are the pistachio and um, um, oaks. These are um, 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 elements that are supposed to come from the Hijaz Mountains closer to Taima when it was possible, especially the pistachio can easily go down the wadis and then um, approach much more Taima from the Hijaz Mountains than in the past. Yes, and then you see um, during the first um, um, uh, phase of lake formation, the vegetation um, indicates rather arid conditions. And um, then um, um, together with the um, um, decrease of delta ATO values indicating an increase in humidity, um, there is a short humid period where the grasses or the grass frequencies um, increase, um, indicating a, a spread um, of the grasslands that were there, but then were more. Um, and then at um, 7,800 or even grasses a little bit earlier, they retreat again, um, the short early Holocene humid period um, finished, and then the desert vegetation continued to um, or semi-desert vegetation continued um, to dominate until the end of our um, record with some fluctuations. But um, yes, never again this um, um, humidity increase is documented, uh, documented during the early Holocene. Um, if we look at the oasis development, um, on first on the pollen record, um, we can see different things. It's, um, as you all know, very difficult. No, Amazon. Um, in in, U, in Central Europe, it's very easy to distinguish between white grasses, pollen, and um, pollen from cereals that are cultivated. But because of the anchors that came from the um, um, region here, it's difficult, and we suppose that it may be a mixture here. It's difficult to distinguish cereal pollen from white grass pollen. It's why um, um, the cereal pollen type here is not really an indicator for cereal pollen, but only pollen types that are larger, um, 40 mu meter, that correspond usually to the cereal type. But we have other, so this is not a good indicator for oasis cultivation in our case for the in the panological pop record, but fortunately we have other types that are um, 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 connected to human land use. That's one, it's olea. That's very difficult to explain, and we don't know what to do with this because it increases after the humid period. Um, and in Taima, uh, it's, uh, we don't know from where it comes. It may be from the Hijas Mountain Tooth, but in an oasis a little bit more in the north, in Poraya, during Bronze Age, you have huge amount of olive, olive wood. So there must may be a use, but it's difficult to prove for Taima. And Cabaridaceae, it's a natural element that may be propagated. But what really is most interesting in Taima, it's if we look at the grape wine, um, the grape wine, the natural distribution or area where it occurs, you see it here. You see clearly that it doesn't um, be part of the natural vegetation in Taima. So here it's the um, limits of the natural distribution of the grape wine, and here's Taima. So when we record the grape wine pollen in the Taima record, it's most probably or it should be the cultivation of the grape wine that was imported there. And um, it doesn't see, but it, the first grape wine pollen was recorded at about 7,000, so here, and um, it started really at um, 6, 5, that the grape wine then pollen was regularly recorded. And the figs that are much more recorded in since about um, 6,800 um, may be part of the oasis cultivation in Taima too. So, um, 
Yes, that's one thing. And unfortunately, our record, it ends at 4,000 before today. But now we can go to the excavation of the um, settlement of o the oasis of Taima. And fortunately, there were a lot of macro remains and um, the earliest macro remains of, um, that were um, found there now, they date um, up to the early Bronze Age or even end of the Calvoliticum. And it's um, summarized here a little bit. Um, so here um, in the first column, it's again the pollen record with the desert or semi-desert vegetation, the short early Holocene period, uh, humid period, and then again the desert vegetation. And here in yellow, it's the record of the cereals. So during the pollen diagram, it's not easy to really say that it was um, cereal cultivation, but um, um, the macro remains clearly show that cereals and beets and beans, at least um, since um, 5,000 before today, and now even a little bit later, because we have new results, um, show that the cereal are cultivated. Um, the other thing is the grape. We had recorded it in the pollen diagram, and we found in the oldest uh, layers of the excavation too um, the pips of the grapes and figs. So this is surely cultivated and is recorded in the macro remains too. Um, and um, we see that only very late, about 3,000 years before today, the date pollen is recorded. Yeah, so this um, shows that there is um, a quite different evolution in the oasis um, cultivation in Taima and in um, Yua. So if we make a short interim summary, we can um, see that the groundwater fed oasis um, at Taima persisted during the Holocene. It was there since um, yes, the early Holocene and that there was only a short humid Holocene period and that oasis cultivation um, started as early as 7,000 before present. So if we now look at these both records, we can summarize the following um, things. For us, we, we may perhaps look at the central Sahara that we saw that um, it's a um, slow, really greening of the Sahara, first with a thorn savanna, then a really dishisa savanna. And um, this was established around lakes in the Onyanga Basin. And um, during the Middle Holocene, the savanna um, proportions fluctuated strongly, showing a highly um, instable environment there. Um, yes, and then we saw that there was a transition between the different ecosystems, it was rather fast, but the main biomass producers, the grasses and the goose food family, it was a rather um, slow uh, decline or change between these both. And then we saw that only about 4,500 years ago, um, natural oasis emerged because before it was really a savanna landscape. Um, and then we saw that in Yoa, it's really um, in the middle in the central Sahara, oasis cultivation, or what we can say, surely that it was really oasis cultivation, started only about 2,000 years ago, together with first records of um, dromedar representations. Um, and then we saw that it was an um, evolution of oasis agriculture that first a native palm, the doom palm, was um, propagated and then only for the last seven, no, for the last thousand years, the date pond really played an, a major importance in oasis cultivation. And in Taima, it was a, a quite different evolution. The semi desert vegetation um, really dominated the hol Holocene, and it was only a very short early humid, early Holocene humid um, period. Um, and um, the cultivation of the oasis started much, much earlier than in um, um, Yua at about 7,000 cal before present. And um, since 5,000 years, there was um, diverse, diverse oasis agriculture in Taima, but no date palms. And the date palms was only recorded 3,000 years ago. Oh, 
um, in Taima. Um, yes, together here again with um, the first Dromeda bones. So if you look in short snapshot, a little bit graphically shown here, you see the differences. And here you see clearly what may be one of the main reasons of the differences. Taima, it's, um, its position of Taima is much more in the north and um, of you are, of course, much more in the south. So the influence of the monsoon is much more um, um, dominant, yes. So if you look at about 6,000 years ago, you have a savanna with lakes in Yoa, and you have already oasis cultivation in um, Taima. In Libya, you have an oasis, but no oasis cultivation. If you look at the time slice 3,000 before present, you see that now oasis emerged in the central Sahara. Um, at oasis Taima, um, it was a derived oasis cultivation, like in Libya. And only um, very, very late oasis cultivation started in Yua, first with um, focus on the native foam palm, and only during the last thousand years, the date palm cultivation started to be important in Yua too. So if we look at the first um, questions we asked, um, we can um, say that um, there was a slow re-greening of the Central Sahara and a slow degreening of the Central Sahara. And um, only at about 4,500, the natural oasis emerged there. And in the Northwestern Arabian Desert, the environmental changes were much smaller, it was only a rather short early Holocene humid period. Yes. Um, and the differences between oasis cultivation are very distinct too. We can see that there is no standardized oasis cultivation pattern um, and that uh, there are distinct regional differences. And what um, may be interesting to it that the oasis cultivation is not a direct um, response to the aridization, to the beginning of the aridization. Huh? It's rather a long-term evolution. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. It was really exciting to hear some um, uh, um, research done on the climate, which is basically surrounding us a little bit to the south and a little bit to the to the east. Yeah. It's uh, very important for us, you know, here. Um, <clears throat> whoever is doing the paleoclimate reconstruction here. Um, so I open the podium for questions. Um, there are questions here in the class, actually. So I will start with those here. You should come over so she can see you. Yeah, she can see you here. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for your presentation. <coughs> I have a question for the, is there any clue in the genetic differences between the seeds uh, for example, the same seed uh, for palm, uh, for uh, 5,000 uh, BP to 1,000 BP, is there, is there any differences in genetic? Um, so we- I mean, I can show the clue of a revolution. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know. Um, so um, the um, the seeds um, for the genetics is rather hard because they are all carbonized. Yes, so it's um, difficult, and they are old, so it's difficult to really do genetics and then. What um, we can try is to do the morphogenetics, uh, morphometrics, yeah, to measure the different shapes. But unfortunately, um, there are not um, many um, uh, seeds of date palms found at um, the timer record. So um, I if the colleague didn't do this, but I think if they come more together from the other oases in the region, that may be an approach to look if the seed size of the date palms varies. Yes, yes. 
And uh, for the pollen, we can't do anything because, um, yes, you saw the pollen, it's rather small and um, it's difficult <laughs> to do there anything. Um, and we looked for genetics in the sediments of the paleolite of Timer because people were interested in wine. Yes, they wanted to ask if they can trace them by um, 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 DNA, DNA. Um, but um, unfortunately, there is no DNA at all preserved in these sediments. So this um, was no approach to to continue to this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps another question here from the audience. Hmm. Ment is coming. Hi, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's a nice one, bringing the eagerness to go there. Um, how do you, I guess this is sedimentary record, and, and in, as every sedimentary record, it's uh, not always complete or uh, balanced. How do you confront the issues of, of balancing the, the rate of sedimentation and, and incomplete or possible incompleteness? Um, so, so, so the question why if, if there the sediment record um, um, has different sedimentation rates no yeah and if the, if the record how do you manage to to work with the data in case that the record is incomplete or uh, I non, assume non continuous I, I assume that the that the sedimentation rate is <coughs> not necessarily uh, constant and no. that uh, it may even have a Hiatuses, like uh, there might be uh, missing pieces in the sedimentation rate, and, and yet you're doing uh, an analysis that is a quantitative analysis of of the quantity of of seeds that you find. How how can you how do you compensate for the for the imbalances in the record? Yes, yes. So um, the first thing, of of course, what we do is uh, what we did is to to establish an edge depth model. So in Timer, it's um, based on um, a short um, wharf chronology that it's floating. Yes, and the the, the rest of the things it's um, focused on on. 14C datings of the pollen that are in the sediment itself. And then we did an age death model and um, um, only the upper part was a little bit um, um, difficult because their sedimentation rates increased heavily. And um, our hypothesis is that um, the, um, <clears throat> And there was probably a mixing of organic material because then the dates became a little bit inconsistent. And we hypothesize that it's because in um, in the corner where we take the core at um, the septa of Timer, um, it was close to the um, 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 gardening of, of of the oasis cultivation. Yes, and then we have an, an input of these sediments too, and it's why we did now a, a, a section through this set. And um, we saw um, that the sediment changed. And yes, so um, we, we tried to get um, a notion of this by um, establishing according the age death model. And um, of course, sedimentology looked at if there are major changes. And in UA, um, there there are two parts where the wars are not continuous, yes. And I, know I have to say first um, that the, the age death model relies on um, WAF counting and 14C dates on um, bulk dates, but uh, as well on um, component specific um, C, yeah, so uh, um, um, long term C13. Um, 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 Verbindungen. Um, and so we constructed the age death model based on WAF counting and on 314 DC dates. And um, what we are doing now, the age death model um, is nearly um, final. And then we want to count the influx. And then we can see how they changed, um, the, the influx changed through time. But you have, you are right, um, it's very complicated because um, even Anne-Marie Lezine, who did the analysis of the upper part, they had major fluctuations in the pollen concentrations. And usually you say, okay, the edge death model is not good there, but it was not the case there, you can't say it. So we have to deal with different input of the pollen um, from different 
climate, also wind regimes, or because the vegetation um, um, fluctuated. And that's where we think that the multiproxy approach will help us even more because Birgit Plessen um, looks at the Delta 18O. And if we have congruent fluctuation in Delta 18O and the pollen, like we had in Talma, we can be more sure that the h delta model is okay, that the sedimentology is okay, and that the vegetation change we recorded um, um, makes sense. <laughs> you hope Thank, it you. Was <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. I think that uh, we have also questions from the audience in virtual audience. Um, Beverly? Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much. Hey. It's really, really wonderful study. And uh, I'm like, eat sick. I'm ready to go, go visit. Um, so I, I think you kind of answered the question that I had, but I, I could you say a little bit more about how you normalize when you're looking at pollen um, variations that certain plants have, like some being more productive with pollen and some being less? Like, is is there a way that you that those numbers can be sort of um, adjusted to give a better reflection of of what that data is showing? Yes. So. It's really hard. Huh? So in, in Europe, we have a lot of um, great data sets. We take the surface samples and then we look at the, <laughs> at the vegetation that surrounds them. And then we try to um, 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 make a um, yeah, we, to adjust them. Um, and then we have an, a notion um, of the pollen productivity estimates of the different vegetation types and um, um, the pollen spectra we find in the sediments. And what we have, it's the surface sample of Lake Yoa and other different um, um, lakes, yes. But as you know, they're very, very rare, yes. So we have very, very few data. And of course, we don't have really the vegetation that was there, yeah. So we have from the manga grasslands, we have with the completed savanna a similar or something similar that we're supposed to have in the, in the, um, Middle Holocene, yes, but it's it's hard, and um, um, we will try to do something like the, to calculate um, theoretically the pollen productivity estimates, and of course um, we have the surface sample and make a training set um, um, of them, but it's still in progress because we have to harmonize as the pollen types, but. Um, yes it's very difficult, and I think the, the best guess is always um, the bad experience of the palynologists knowing that they are underrepresented and overrepresented um, 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 taxa or pollen types. Um, yes, and we are relying on them and on some investigations they did in, in southern um, or more in the southern part of Africa in one savanna. So there are five pollen types we can relate a little bit and say, okay, they're overrepresented, not represented, but it's a hard job and it's the thing that most other people don't believe in palynologists because yes, it's um, you look at them and you look at the vegetation, the surface samples, and but it's hard to um, opera operationalize this. Yes, um, so we are on the way to doing it with the surface sample we have from the African pollen database. Yes, but yes, no, the, the most of them are on the Nile Valley. Yes, so it's um, a little bit useless for us. Yeah, but we'll do our best with the samples we now um, have from you are. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, are there more questions from the audience in on Zoom? No questions. Um, well, uh, Michelle, thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. I also would like to go to those places. We go together. <laughs> we, should, we, should, we should make a big thing yeah, yeah, then. Yeah, surely. <laughs> I, I was wondering if you wish to stay connected to us with the seminar. Yes, I, I would be very pleased. So I um, will join them next um, to here just. It's possible, I think. No, we are the same. You know, you yes, know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, it will be okay. a great pleasure for me. Yes. Fantastic. Yes, yeah. So we will add you to our uh, to our oh, yeah. distribution. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a great okay. pleasure. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Fantastic. So we wish you um, an excellent continuation of your day over there yeah. in Berlin. We wish also to be there, by the <laughs> oh, way. <it's> cold. <laughs>
Well, here it's okay. too hot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and to everybody, have a great yeah. afternoon. Okay, and see Thank you next week. Thank you very week. much. Yeah. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.